My task now is to talk about the role of the radical cystectomy in the non-most invasive disease. I have no conflicts of interest with this talk. So you all know, majority of bladder cancers uh, come on a TA, T1 stage, 50-70%. The majority are low grade. And if you stratify the non-invasive disease, 70% are TA, 20% T1, roughly 10% are carcinoma in situ. And the management, you all know. We do uh, transurethral resection. We offer these patients intravesical uh, therapy with a chemotherapy agent or immunotherapy, being BCG. Uh, recently, we have systemic therapy options. So the pembrolizumab has been the first approved checkpoint inhibitor uh, drug in this space. And then, of course, radical cystectomy. We're not going to get into much detail on the technical aspect because the radical cystectomy is the same we do for most invasive disease, should include lymph node dissection and everything like that. So let's talk about more about the indications. And um, one important aspect is the staging. The staging needs to be very precise, very accurate. And then there's uh, the, the role for the re rbt So I'm gonna talk about this again. It was already mentioned by Dr. Lerner, but it's one of the most critical steps in the management of this disease. 10 to 20% of these tumors, they are under stage with uh, the first 2RBT, even if it was in your hands and a very expert hands. Uh, we expect 30 to 50% of residual T1 disease. So uh, um, it's really important to go ahead and resect it again. If you can prove that there's no muscle invasion, the, the understaging drops to less than 10%. So it, it's really, really important. Improves the efficacy of intravesical therapy as well. And also has prognostic value, as you can see, uh, for TIS only disease and a T1 high grade, you can identify high rates of progression and that's gonna be the focus, the patient that you're gonna really start talking about cystectomy even though they don't have invasive disease. So the first group of indications for cystectomy on normal invasive disease are those uh, related to patient factors and uh, tumor factors. So typically it's the tumor that is endoscopically unresectable and this is regardless of staging and risk groups. So they're typically large, very extensive. Even if you take several rounds of a TUR resections, you could potentially resect it, but these patients are usually bleeding. They have transfusions, several trips to the ER. Many times it's hard to manage the comorbidities and uh, get them prepared for surgical procedure, endoscopic procedure every time. So it becomes really a manageable, uh, um, a manageable condition to do endoscopically. Uh, other than that, uh, another situation is tumors that is hard to treat or hard to monitor, so the diverticulum is one of those situations. Many times you don't have access to the resect in the diverticulum. If it's high-grade disease, you shouldn't be doing anyways. There's risk of perforation, so in those cases, the indication is actually for a diverticulectomy or a partial or even radical cystectomy. Um, and at the bottom here, the main bullet, are the patients when you see T1 high-grade disease at the re -T -T. So second round, if you go there, you think you resected everything first time around and you come back, there's again a papillary high-grade disease, this is a red alert. So those are the patients that will not do well. So why we're so concerned about progression? So this is why. This is a large single institution retrospective study and they identified over 760 patients uh, who had cystectomy for muscle invasive disease and they classify the, the, the disease by primary muscle invasion at presentation or what they call progressive, meaning they presented non-invasive and progressive during the follow-up. And then they compare both groups with a median follow-up of 85 months. You can see in the curves here for recurrence-free survival, cancer-specific survival, sorry, I'll go back. And uh, overall survival, uh, there's a significant difference if these tumors actually progress towards muscle invasion. Um, furthermore, they look at, uh, they, they control for all these factors here on the left and uh, on a multivariable analysis for the same outcomes, that statistical significance is still remain true. This systematic review with meta-analysis also look at the same question. They identified 14 studies, more than 4,000 cases, and these patients, again, also had radical cystectomy for muscle invasive disease, and they classified as primary or secondary, being the ones who progress into muscle invasion uh, uh, state. And uh, they look into the hazard uh, ratio for uh, cancer-specific survival, and uh, in two different models, you can see in the forest plots, it favors towards uh, worst outcome towards the secondary muscle invasive 3 cystectomy. 
So, okay, let's look now on the non-invasive group. So this was done, uh, 105 patients, they have T1 high-grade disease, and uh, they offer cystectomy if they had minimum of two risk factors. So the risk factors in the study were carcinoma in situ, presence of a greater than three centimeters tumor or multifocal disease. So minimal two, they offer cystectomy up front. Um, 51 refused cystectomy and were treated initially with BCG, but then at the first sign of recurrence, they, were, they, 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 they received the cystectomy. So then they compare the outcome of those two groups, and then you can see with the five-year cancer-specific survival, there was, a, there was a clear difference between those curves. Dr. Lerner also showed this study, but showing that the patients who have deferred treatment do worse. Um, and interestingly, when they look at the group separately, the groups who had early cystectomy here on the left versus the group who have deferred cystectomy, and what's the impact of the CIS, the presence of CIS really impacts the outcomes. So you can see this split in the curve here if they have deferred therapy, meaning CIS that is not properly treated or treated definitively progresses over time. So uh, looking at the studies, becomes clear, right? We should offer radical cystectomy for every single patient with T1 high grade. Well, not so fast. So um, um, we know that 50% or more of these patients with a non-invasive disease still have a durable response with uh, DUR and BCG and intravesical therapies. And also, cystectomy is a morbid procedure and uh, with a significant impact in the quality of life. So the main questions here are, how can we predict those who are going to progress, and also how can we identify the most aggressive cancers so we can treat those aggressively and spare the others from the morbidity? So in terms of risk stratification, you're all familiar with this, EORTC tables. Uh, this was published by Sylvester a long time ago, and uh, based on a score system, we classified in low, intermediate, and high-risk tumors. You can see the probability of progression at one and five years here at the bottom for the intermediate and high-risk groups. These numbers are very significant. This is the AOA version using the same risk factors. Um, you also seen this already today. Very importantly, there is this subclassification of the very high-risk patients. So these additional features add additional risk. So this is the focus of your, uh, this is the patient should be focusing into talking radical cystectomy as a possibility or something that should, you know, they should consider early. So this leads us to the second group of indications, which is related to the adverse histology. So presence of lymphovascular invasion, very well known established risk factor. The presence of carcinoma in situ, also very important. And the prostatic, retro, prostatic retro involvement. And also, we're talking about histology. So micropapillary variant, uh, is, it's uh, emerged uh, lately in the last 20 years, at 20 years, and is shown to be an aggressive uh, uh, subtype of cancer. Other types of cancer, like a neuroendocrine, uh, especially the small cell, which is very prevalent in bladder, and other, other variants like uh, sarcomatoid differentiation, um, uh, plasma cytoid, and uh, nested variants, they are all very aggressive and should be considered for cystectomy up front. Um, this is just an illustration. Um, this is a single center, over 1,200 patients uh, with a normal invasive disease and that they uh, identified uh, variant histology in about 100 of these patients, and they compared with other 140 patients with uh, uh, conventional histology. They excluded sarcomatoid, and they excluded small cell uh, from this group because those are not only more aggressive, and these patients clearly have a worse outcome. But then, out of those same 100 patients, they uh, um, treated 41 with uh, BCG initially, and 59 with cystectomy. And then they, they look at the outcomes compared to those, groups, those two groups. So here on the right, you can see the curves uh, where the, the different histology variants is split in terms of uh, survival curves. And this is when they lump them together and compare variant histology versus conventional histology. And then you see this, this split and the difference there. Two, five years overall, disease-specific, progression-free, and recurrence-free survivals were significantly worse for patients who have um, uh, variant histology. So um, another word about the micropapillary seems to be the most important. So this is data from MD Anderson, and this is the largest series we have published in the literature. Uh, they have, uh, in 2015, they had 283 patients with a micropapillary disease. Out of those, 72 had non-invasive disease at that time. 
and uh, 40 were treated initially with BCG, other 26 were treated with uh, upfront cystectomy. So you can see how the, cur the curves is split for the five-year cancer-specific survival with 100% for the patients who had upfront cystectomy versus 60% for those who were initially treated with BCG. If you look at the progression-free survival and recurrence-free survival within the group who received BCG, you see that those numbers are low. They are lower than actually regular numbers you see on the, on the conventional histology. Um, then, further on, when these patients uh, progress into muscle, muscle invasive disease and receive cystectomy, uh, they compare the outcomes. Upfront cystectomy versus delayed cystectomy, and is 100% versus 62% disease survival. So we can see how delaying therapy, upfront cystectomy, definitive therapy impacts the survival of these patients. And then, ultimately, the patients who progress into uh, invasive or more advanced states, they had a survival uh, uh, of 24% of five-year disease-free survival, of a median uh, a survival of uh, 35 months. So really, really high numbers. Um, and another important data, even those who had better outcome and had upfront cystectomy, is still 27% of them had upstaging, and another 20% had lymph node disease. So we're talking about patients with a non-invasive bladder cancer. So third group of indications, those are the ones who fail treatment. So this was already mentioned, either patients who are unresponsive to BCG or cannot get BCG, either because they are intolerant or BCG is not, is not available. So criteria, quickly as you know, all the, taking the intolerant out of the equation, all the other previous definitions now are lumped into the BCG unresponsive, and the criteria is the five plus two, meaning two cycles, two inductions or induction plus one maintenance, and they need to receive at least five out of the six planned installations from the first maintenance, and at least two out of the either six from the second induction or three of the first maintenance. So that's why it's five plus two. Additionally, patients who have carcinoma in situ, plus minus high grade papillary disease within 12 months, or papillary high grade disease within six months, that's also considered uh, 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 BCG responsive. And finally, and more importantly, patients who have high-grade T1 disease and the first evaluation after induction. So that's another criteria for us to classify them and manage accordingly. So Dr. Lerner already mentioned on this, but we always put the, in, on top of this, of this box, consider radical cystectomy for patients who are BCG and responsive, always. Of course, there's valrubicin val approved for uh, carcinoma in situ only. There's the pembrolizumab approved, uh, vicinium, instiladrine all coming up, and a lot of other drugs coming up. You can use uh, chemotherapy, combination of chemotherapy, as, as was mentioned. But um, uh, again, just to show how, how important this is, this is a data from the Multicenter International database, and they look a very large number of patients undergoing cystectomy, uh, and they were able to identify 243 patients with clinical carcinoma in situ only. So carcinoma in situ alone, and uh, they were all treated with BCG and then had a cystectomy afterwards. And very interesting numbers. Um, they are they seen upstaging in 36% of these patients, a quarter of them upstaged to muscle invasive disease. Uh, they have 5.8% of a nodal positive disease and a 9% also of a lymphovascular invasion. So very, very sober numbers. And uh, when they look at the, at the impact of a lymphovascular invasion in this subgroup, you can see the split of the curves. It's amazing how lymphovascular invasion is a very, very important uh, survival prognostic factor. So summarizing everything, putting together all those groups, uh, first indication, failure to resect. So large, extensive patients with medical conditions, uh, tumors that are difficult to, 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 uh, to resect or monitor or in diverticulum, and also patients with a T1 high grade present at the re-TUR. In terms of pathology, uh, presence of a lymphovascular invasion, carcinoma in situ, prostatic urethra involvement, and uh, the variant histologies, micropapillary, small cell, sarcomatoid, plasmocytoid, nested, all those variants have higher risk. And patients who, have, who are uh, uh, having treating, treatment failure, either they're BCG unresponsive or they don't have BCG available, those are all indications for cystectomy. So in conclusion, cystectomy plays a very important role, an integral role in the management of a non-muscle invasive disease. 
uh, especially in high-risk disease where we've seen progression is higher, survival is lower, and these patients have a worse outcome with the defer treatment. We know radical mastectomy is morbid and with significant impact in terms of quality of life, so, so it's not for all, but it offers excellent oncological outcomes and a potential benefit of abbreviated monitoring follow-up for patients who have their bladder completely removed and don't have to worry about that anymore in the future. So our challenge is identify the most aggressive tumors at the diagnosis, and we can use risk factors, molecular, genetic uh, uh, biomarkers. So then we can select the best candidates for upfront cystectomy and offer that as a primary modality, sparing all the others in the lower risk from the morbidity procedure.